Ukraine's diaspora of professionals and refugees are playing an extraordinary role in supporting Ukraine, both materially, but also by raising awareness of its cause in their host countries and within the international community. But also those who've remained uh, are playing a huge role in helping to draw attention to Ukraine's plight. Today, I'm speaking with Julia Timoshenko, who is fighting for Ukraine on the informational front running marketing and communications for St. Javelin, and as editor-in-chief at Ukraina. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. If you enjoy the material we create, then please like and subscribe to help boost the popularity of our videos in YouTube, and of course, to help people discover the fantastic speakers that we feature. Julia, I'm delighted to welcome you onto the channel. Thank you so much for having me. Now, the audiences may not be familiar with the work of St. Javelin uh, or Ukraina, um, and, and, and I would love to learn a lot more about them as well. So please, could you describe you know, what's your role and what are these two organizations? Well, St. Javelin is a, a social enterprise that was created from a phenomenon of a meme and uh, sort of a symbol of Ukrainian resistance, the Mary with the javelin, which is a symbol of defense and resistance that flew across the world. And uh, it was the social enterprise was founded by Christian Boris, Canadian journalist who lived in the past in Ukraine and really understood the intricacies of our history with Russia and the fact that Russia might uh, do a full-scale invasion. So he sort of started fundraising even before the full-scale invasion in February. And once it happened, it it raised millions for Ukraine. And it's still helping and doing everything they can to sort of support Ukraine on informational front and also physically here on the ground uh, in the country. And Ukrainer, that's how you pronounce it. You don't have to say Ukrainer. Ukrainer is a more common, is a volunteer media platform that has been covering um, Ukraine for um, a couple of years now and has been sort of helping Ukrainians and the foreigners to discover Ukraine from the inside. They've been taking uh, people sort of one, uh, ex uh, ex um, sorry, <laughs> stumble. <clears throat> If this is, can I start over and then? Yeah, sure. I can cut. I'll definitely cut that. I don't know why I started coughing. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so Ukraine there is a volunteer media platform that has been showing in the world and in Ukrainians, our country from the inside. They've been filming expeditions around the country and going to the regions that it might not be as popular, touristy and familiar to people. They've been talking to people, covering their lives there. Um, so they've had a sort of a broad spectrum spectrum of ethnographic, uh, beautiful articles and video and other multimedia channels throughout the years. And obviously, when the full scale invasion happened, a lot of those territories, especially that they've filmed in the past, like for example, uh, Tavria, where her son is, or uh, Slobozhanshina, where all the Kharkiv and other um, areas are, they became occupied. So they realized that they need to fight for those areas and for Ukraine also on an informational front and uh, tackle Russian propaganda and show specifically that um, you have to learn from about Ukraine from Ukrainians. Because, for example, their article, Jews in Ukraine, uh, that they've written a couple years in the past, it started skyrocketing as the invasion happened because obviously Russia has been trying to, I don't know, create this insane false story of some sort of Nazism in Ukraine and people were actually trying to find out what's happening. So media like Ukraine has been doing great great job to actually uh, debunk and show Russian propaganda and show the real Ukraine from the inside. And of course, I think everyone's aware that Ukraine's president uh, is is Jewish, uh, and family history goes back to uh, terrible suffering during the Holocaust. Um, it's less well known that also the prime minister is Jewish, and and members of the cabinet and many members of the leading yeah. political parties and institutions. Um, there's an extraordinary strong uh, Jewish culture that perhaps doesn't have comparison. Uh, to any other country in Europe. Well, not now. I mean, maybe prior to the Second World War, it would have, but uh, it's, it's it's extraordinary to see. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's sort of been like a known fact. Uh, 
I wouldn't say that it was like a breaking through like news when we elected the president who is Jewish. Like, I don't think people actually paid a lot of attention to that. Like, obviously they've been talks, but it wasn't like the main thing, which is, I think is great because it means that people weren't as fixated on that. They were more concerned about his policies, his stance on Russia and other important things, but his um, ethnicity and, you know, roots weren't really like the big thing that was defining his career or in his election, which I think shows that Ukrainian society actually is very much um, open-minded and not as, you know, not anything that Russia tries to portray, in fact. Pluralistic and more sophisticated. I mean, um, for anyone who's who's lived in Russia, the idea that uh, you would have a Jewish president in Russia is is almost inconceivable, uh, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine any kind of, you know, diversity in Russian top head government or whatsoever. Like, it's also probably really tough for, like, any women to hold any kind of cabinet except for those maybe, like, token deputies and members of the party that are, like, Putin fans. So it is... Uh, it is really hard to imagine anybody who obviously Jewish in the position of a Russian president or any kind of top. But it's also really hard to imagine anybody but Putin at this point in, in the position of a Russian president because Russia is stuck in the mindset of sticking to one strong fist and not letting it go and not trying to see any change. It's also always really funny to me when I see on social media um Russians who come to like either my comments sections on Twitter or Instagram or like I see it on, under other people's posts that Russians accuse us of being a mess of a country because we have president changing every five years and I was like wow it's so like extraordinary for you to understand what it's like to live in democracy where it's like a healthy change of a government and it's normal and it's like fine so, um, yeah, it's a totally different mindset. And at this point, I think we were like a completely two different worlds. So it's really, it has been bothering me before the full scale invasion when uh, some politicians, media obviously have been trying to perpetuate this narrative of like, oh, Ukraine and Russia are basically the same people, brotherly nation. They like think the same. They have kept shared history. They have shared culture. And then in reality, no, it's not. Especially like younger generations, we're like, nothing i think that those are that those counterparts in that country so i think it's very important to uh distinguish that's that's one of the uh key propagandistic narratives isn't it which uh hopefully people who've been watching the videos uh will very quickly understand that uh you know that that is uh is a is, is a whopping untruth let's say um I mean, before we uh, before we move on to, uh, and I've got lots of questions about Ukraine uh, and the kind of formats and uh, and content it produces, as well as its influence. Um, but it's also worth pointing out, isn't it, in terms of? I mean, you mentioned um, potential future leaders uh, in place of Putin, and it's very difficult to imagine because perhaps the only politician who would have naturally sort of fitted the role of leader um, and who had a completely unambiguous moral stance uh vis-a-vis -vis Crimea um lawlessness and so on was Boris Nensov you know extremely adept and capable politician he spoke out immediately uh against the occupation of Crimea and unambiguously stated that it needed to be handed back uh and he of course he predicted the full-scale war and as a result was 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 killed uh within the shadow of the Kremlin's walls and I think that tells you everything you need to know about that uh um degenerate political system yeah i mean it's a um, it really makes you understand that the change in russia is really needed but you're as a ukrainian i'm not sure in what way it can happen i can only see and hope for uh the indigenous republics of russia uh, breaking away and starting the turmoil, but I really doubt that it's going to come from any kind of elitist, good Russians, as they call them, uh, quote unquote, uh, that live in Moscow, St. Petersburg, you know, support Navalny, say that they're in, instead of against the war and actually they don't do 
anything like obviously you see all of this campaign campaign for free in Navalny now they like nominated uh, the documentary about him and Oscar and Ukrainians are actually really really critical of him and a lot of even Western ex experts on Ukraine and or academics, I don't know, politicians, they are really um, not understanding why Ukrainians are so like against Navalny and don't, and don't support this whole, um, I guess, PR campaign for him. And it's because like, it, it, like he was not like uh, Nimto, he was actually, I mean, he is actually imperialist. He actually doesn't have a stance in Crimea. He thinks that, oh no, it's never got, coming back to you guys. He also supported the invasion of Georgia, which I think is some is a major factor that led to a full scale invasion of Ukraine. And uh, obviously, not a single person probably deserves the kind of like inhumane treatment that he might be going through in the Russian prison. But it's also like makes you question why he's still alive, you know, like, I think it's a horrible question to ask, but, um, you know, if if somebody who was so against invasion of Crimea, other things that are so kind of like set in against Russian empire was immediately killed. And then there is another person that sort of like is an opposition leader, but still, you know, is kept there and is, maybe used as a political tool as well for Putin mm. to show that, hey, we, we have an opposition here, here, like all of these uh, Russians, you know, supporting it. It's kind of might be the same as um, the, as we call it, like a stand up in Ukraine of Marina Vsyannikova when she came out on the TV with a poster of mm -hmm. Stop the War. And uh, immediately everybody started praising her, calling her a hero. And uh, by everyone, I mean people from the West mostly. And I think us Ukrainians, we've seen that so many times at this point that we're really skeptical. And sometimes people think that we're crazy, that it's like a conspiracy theory that like all oh, Russian government just planted her or something. But to be honest, like we we question these things, like why why she can't kind of like was allowed to go on TV. Everything is like pre-recorded on Russian TV. I don't think you can get to it and then she was traveling around Europe advocating for lifting sanctions from the Russian people so it really makes you you know yeah question because we can tell that if Putin really doesn't like somebody that somebody is going to be gone within days mm. that's right and I think uh, I think up until recently in Navalny you could have made the case that he is there as a hostage when um Russia was still selling gas to Europe, you could see why, you know, uh, to prevent further sort of sanctions being imposed, why they wouldn't take that final step. It is a little baffling uh, why he's alive now. I kind of fear that he he probably won't be soon. I mean, he looks like he's in a in a terrible condition. What what? And I, I didn't I didn't want to I didn't want to sort of talk about Russia so much, but I guess it is it is it is interesting, um, and it is important. Um, the thing that baffles me is the difference between um, Maidan and the behaviors we saw there. Even the protests in Belarus, which were far more reminiscent, you know, they didn't succeed, but they were like a, they were like a Maidan that, that, that was snuffed out. But genuine sort of organic mass protest. There you had genuine, mass exodus of sort of intellectuals and even propagandists and anchors they came to a tipping point where they said look enough is enough and they they kind of left so you had a genuine popular movement that was trying to reproduce what ukraine has done several times over which is prevent a slide back into autocracy what baffles me about the tactics of the liberal opposition and I watch a lot of the material, and they're very, very skilled, of course, at media, very skilled at information. And a lot of that information is truthful. What they're less skilled at is, one, stating policies and tactics of how they're actually going to run the country and reverse this totalitarian system. But also, if you compare them to the 19th century, where you had revolutionaries, nihilists, you had an you know, extraordinary often violent, it has to be said, but you had extraordinary range of, of movements um, within Russia trying to challenge autocracy at various periods. 
there seems to be very little of that. You know, there's partisan action, whether that's run by Ukraine or local partisans, we don't know. Is it coordinated? Probably not hugely centrally coordinated. There just doesn't seem to be the backbone to fight the regime amongst the liberals. You know, they're they're behaving in an extremely soft and I would say sort of vegetarian way. You know, you'd use that phrase that was described up until Bolotna in 2012, uh Vremena. They still seem to be stuck in that, in that sort of, you know, soft hybrid uh mode of action. Whereas what's required now is something far harder and more militant. More radical, definitely. Yeah, I think it's like it's one of those things because I uh, Maidan revolution was one of the monumental points, obviously, in Ukraine's history, but also in um, the development, like the growth of the new generations of Ukrainians like myself, because I was still like a teenager. I was in high school watching that happening. My dad was going there helping uh, for a few days because we, we, my family lives outside of Kiev. Obviously, getting to Kiev was really difficult. I remember even them trying to cut our connection within the country so like people wouldn't communicate and less people would get to travel to Kiev to um, protest. But it was insane. It was extraordinary. Even like very, quote unquote, apolitical people, they were standing up uh, and they were like there. And obviously the youth that was fighting against the military with like uh, stones and sticks. And it was just um really monumental for me as well to understand the cost of our of our freedom and um, so yeah Maidan for me was a thing that really uh, made me understand what's the cost of freedom in Ukraine and something that I will be fighting for no matter what and uh, in my understanding obviously it was that fighting for a democracy for a country that develops and grows uh, and a society that evolves uh, and the country that meets the European standards of life and kind of a social um, development as well. And I never knew that actually, I mean, obviously I I had those thoughts at that point when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, but I think I was really denying the fact that something like 2022 could happen and that we actually had to, would have to physically fight for our freedom again as if in the previous century. So um, seeing the ineptness of Russian liberal opposition and the young people and how they really take like almost zero action to um, fight their regime is appalling because I think we even we've seen we, we see a revolution in Iran that is incredibly inspiring. We see women and very vulnerable groups leading them because oftentimes we hear arguments of, oh, but Russian cannot protest because it's like scary and like life threatening to them. Like, of course it is. Like nobody's uh, denying that, but it, it shouldn't stop you because if, if the entire country unites against the tyrannical government, they cannot do anything. Mm. And um you know seeing this comparison with the Iran revolution and like the women and also how many protests against the Islamic Republic Iran and Iranians have held outside of Iran like in Europe in uh, United States and other countries around the world to show that they are standing united have we seen anything like this from Russians in all these years no and when the liberal opposition gets asked like why you're not protesting even if you're like in the safety because a lot of you as you say are in exile in other countries they say that oh but it's like it's not going to make any difference to try to uh, throw a regime uh in russia from europe but some somehow it makes sense for them to buy ads for free Naval navalny on times square and do this pr campaign in, among the hollywood actors in order to free Navalny. So I really don't understand the how they're fighting and what's the tactic here. But for us Ukrainians, it seems very hypocritical. And obviously, yeah, as you said, like I don't want to talk as much about Russia specifically, but I think this distinguish uh, this difference between Ukrainians um, of a new generation generation and Russians who claim themselves to be a new gener generation and opposition and young and sort of open-minded people is huge and i think they still have a lot of the russian mentality of just being very inactive 
Mm, and passive, yeah. isn't it? Like passive. the consumption of information, even if the media output is good and, and a lot of it actually is quite good, there's, you know, you've got Michael Naki, of course, is a journalist, not a, not a politician. Um, uh, Ruslan Laiyev, who does, you know, excellent military analysis. Um, I really like uh, Ivan Zhdanov and his attitude. He seems to be a, like a really nice guy. Um but the passive consumption of information, even if it's excellent information, is not the same thing as activism at all, is it? So, yeah. I mean, in that respect, let, let's turn to Ukraine, because it seems to me that even though it's information uh, that you're conveying in this publication, it is far more activist in its purpose, because you've got a clear goal, you've got a clear idea, which is to communicate um, not just sort of, you know, like a, like a tourist magazine, the sort of beauty of uh, Ukraine as a destination. You're trying to convey something of the spirit, the character, the evolution of society. So let's talk a bit about the kind of materials that uh, Ukraine produces. Yeah, so um, I already talked a little bit more about like what they've been producing in the past and showing Ukraine um to Ukrainians and to foreigners from a different angle, maybe that people have seen before. And even as, for example, Ukrainians ourselves, our country is huge and uh, very little people have a privilege to travel all around the country because it's really big. And also a lot of people just don't even know what's there and why would you should, why would you go there and what is there to explore? Because I think a lot of years we've been under this sort of, idea that also maybe been has been installed to us by Russia that oh our country is like not interesting it's it's worse than Russia Russia is beautiful and big and there's so so much to see in Russia but Ukraine what is even Ukraine it's it's relatively boring and you know less of something that is there in Russia obviously and and that idea I think is sitting was sitting in the minds of a lot of Ukrainians. Hopefully, it's very different now. But uh, Ukraine started actually fighting that stereotype and showing the country from the inside and showing the people and the diversity of our country. And I think like one of their incredible works on diversity is their book and series of publication called "Who, Are, Who We Are: The National Communities in Ukraine." that sort of explores the different ethnic and national minorities that live in the country and show where they came from, like what, how do they live? Like, for example, very few people know that Mariupol was actually populated by Greeks and there is a huge Greek community. I don't know if it's correct to say is, was uh, before uh, 2022 that was largely obviously impacted and their homes were wiped out by Russia. So um, I think this is something that you don't see in Russia specifically, like they don't, they don't take pride in the national minorities. They just like repress them and want to assimilate them to make them Russian, but they will never allow them to be on the same stance as like Russians. And, um, after February 24th of 2022, Ukraine also started publishing lots of articles on what's going on right now, obviously, in the how Ukrainians are resisting, how they're helping to fight on all fronts, covering volunteering efforts, covering extraordinary, extraordinary efforts of Ukrainians who just do everything to bring the victory closer and to help our country win. Um, one of the series that are also incredibly important and are currently being translated to English because they came out in Ukrainian is a series of videos uh, called The Occupation. Um, where Ukraine our team travels to recently liberated territories, like for example, Kharkiv region, Kherson and others, Kyiv region in March, um, in the end of March, and speaks to people and asks them uh, and collects this first hand accounts of what it's like to live under Russian occupation and how people have been resisting and what were like even the smallest acts that people were doing to let the occupiers know that you're not welcome here, you're not going to stay here for a long time. And I think obviously the world have seen the uh, the celebration of liberation of her son and how much people were happy to see Ukrainian military. And this is something that's also incredibly important to capture because hopefully after these uh, videos and after 
uh, after the world sees actually that Ukrainians want to be in Ukraine, under Ukraine, nobody can call whatever Russia makes up there a referendum and nobody can call that any kind of legitimate election because obviously if you vote under the gun and if they make up the votes for you, um, this is something that can never be considered as a legitimate cause for any kind of political decisions. And and hopefully we can use that as well to remind how Crimea was annexed and how the election in Crimea happened as well. So Ukraine works a lot, obviously, to cover the culture, the broad diversity, the beauty of Ukraine, but also tackling this very specific Russian narratives. And rather than just debunking them, showing like the people inside Ukraine and showing the true facts and how it actually looks uh, and translating them to actually a lot of different languages. English is not the one, Polish and English are sort of like the biggest one, but also we have other 10 languages that are constantly being um, included into our website or social media and help people from those countries who speak those specific languages to also find this information when they Google in their native language and when they want to learn about Ukraine. Because um, we all know that Russia have spent billions of dollars on propaganda abroad. We know about Russia Today channels and how they've been actively working in different languages in other countries, especially in Europe. We know the results of that, like for example, in Italy, where Russia Today has been watched by a lot of people during that time and a lot of Italians actually didn't even realize the the true situation on the ground in Ukraine and the history and Ukraine has never had that I've sort of you know obviously um, organized counter propaganda abroad so it's really difficult to do it now but obviously it's incredibly important and a lot of Ukrainians are uniting to counter that and work in different countries to showcase Ukraine as it is and our history and the situation. And uh, I'm really happy to see that unity on the informational front. And it's incredibly important, isn't it? Because Russian propaganda doesn't just exist at a sort of, you know, obvious, inept, clownish level. It exists at every single level. They throw multiple narratives out, you know, short term, long term, like throwing spaghetti at a wall. So even though territories like Kherson uh, have been liberated um, and others will be still, it may be easier to dispel some of the more obvious narratives like the fake referenda and so on. But there will be deeper cultural narratives, deeper political narratives that people who've been exposed to Russian propaganda and, and propagandistic TV over a long period, um, those are far difficult, more difficult to challenge and, and root out, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I think Russian propaganda and Russian soft power um, can be traced centuries ago. Uh, I don't know, maybe we could start with the fact that they've named themselves under the name of Kiev and Rus, although they have sort of nothing to do with the with the real you know uh, ancestors of the sorry not the, those who come after Kiev and Rusik for example Ukraine and other Slavic countries and they appropriate Slavic country uh, Slavic culture and then show it to the world as Russian which is a huge uh, way of waging soft power and making people really favorable towards Russia I've read an article recently in I think Los Angeles Times that was titled Why Cancelling Russian Language is Not a Way of Supporting Ukraine. And I was really kind of intrigued by the um by the title. And then I, I read from the author who is an American um, I think journalist who studied Russian in the past in America in the university, um, and obviously has close relationship with it now that she've learned that she probably read a lot of Russian literature and have been exposed to a Russian culture. But her take was very interesting because she she started to advocate for people to not drop Russian courses because Amer- apparently in America, um, the enrollment into Russian language courses or Russian literature or any kind of Russian studies is at the historic low. Like it's never been seen in that level before because actually Russian or Slavic, as they call them, but they're 
basically always Russian studies have been really popular in a lot of American institutions, um, colleges and universities. And uh, she was advocating that Russian is really important because it allows um, the people, you know, Westerners to speak to the people of the former uh, Russian empires. To, so to speak to people like Kaz Kazakhs, Ukrainian, Belarusian people, um, I don't know, Georgians, everybody who had have been touched in the past by a Russian empire or a Soviet empire. And I was really trying to understand how she did not see the point, which I think is a crucial there, that using the language of a colonizer is not the best way to understand the formerly colonized or the currently mm. colonized. Russia is still an empire that's still keeping a lot of indigenous people under its blanket. And it's really incredible how she doesn't see it completely. She actually uses such sentences as like, oh, if we drop, you know, this like tool, like if we cancel Russian language and we stop learning it, we will lose access to these people because we will not be able to speak in their language. She calls it their language without even exploring why Russian became our language and how other uh, local languages have been repressed, including Ukrainians, for decades, centuries, and it's it's amazing how much you you think that you learn about you know Eastern Europe, this region, but in fact you only learn about Russia, and you only learn to see this part of the world from the Russian lens because you've only been exposed to academics who have written about Russia and worked in Russia. You have only been exposed to journalists, maybe, who have been also covering Eastern Europe from a Moscow-based office. And you can really see the effects of that on how Ukraine have been, has been covered throughout uh, the past 20 years, especially leading to the full-scale invasion, how a lot of analysts underestimated Ukraine because of their knowledge of this society from the Russian perspective, and so on. So I think all of that is Russian propaganda and all of this should be treated as such. And, and we should take those institutions and actually understand how they uh, helped Russia to succeed in some of its goals. Yeah, and I, I had a very interesting conversation. I mean, there's a lot of nuance behind this. I mean, I would also argue that learning Russian has never been more important, but from the point of view that you need to know what your enemy is saying. Um, so from a military planning point of view, you know, that, 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 that yeah, is probably I, sensible I mean, I kind of, from a soft yeah, power when, point of view, no. Yeah, when I when I read the title of the article, I expected that to be as the argument, because I think that's that's the hardest to argue with, obviously. I think I think that is the only kind of argument that I will accept. Because I was like, okay, um, I would say like, okay, you want to learn what the enemy is saying. I understand that. I think obviously Ukrainians have a huge advantage of speaking Russian and uh, Russians don't have the same advantage. They, they don't speak Ukrainian. That's why they've been caught in different areas in Ukraine. That's why it's like easier to expose them if they're like spies or saboteurs in other cities. And I think obviously this language is, is incredibly um, important advantage that we have although it's been forced on us and I can see why people like, you know, you or like anybody who's a military analyst who wants to learn uh, about Russia to know what are you fighting against would learn the language. But all of these sort of people who just in love with Russian culture because they studied in the past and they said to see it go away uh, and how they argument it now, because obviously they can say, oh my gosh, I love Russia. It's like such a great, great place. Now it's kind of like, oh, tricky to say that in a public space, they now use the diversity of the former Russian empires and as if they actually want to learn about them and as if it opens this like breath of cultures to them. But in fact, they're actually not trying to learn anything about them because what you learn to the, about those people by speaking to them in Russian, by using the language of a colonizer, it's actually not going to show you the you know, the main part that you actually need to know about the struggles and the history of these people and their cultures that you can only get access to in their language. And obviously mm -hmm. it's trickier if you learn their language because maybe it's not represented, but I think it's something that you have to keep in mind when you try to push that argument for Russian. That's right. And it it, it creates a sort of echo. I mean, first of all, I think a lot of the... Um... 
a lot of the sort of academics and journalists who perhaps there aren't that many now, but there are some who still speak with, as you say, quite sort of nostalgic and fairly soft terms and say, well, it's Putin's war. It's not Russia's war. Russians are against, Russians are against it, blah, 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 blah. It may be that their small circle of intellectual liberal friends in St. Petersburg, Moscow, et cetera, may express opinions that they know the foreigners want to hear. Um, you know, uh, but you don't know what they're going to say when they're amongst, uh, you know, their own. Uh, you don't know necessarily, unless you're following them, what they're going to say in Telegram and other channels. It may be that they do hold genuinely... Uh, you know, anti-colonial views. And I think, you know, whenever you come across a Russian who creates a clear, unambiguous statement that they are against statism, that they are for the decolonialization of Russia, when they demonstrate that they've put in the time and the effort to really understand the implications of that colonial history, I think those people have to be embraced. How many of them are there? I mean, that it, it's... I haven't... I've, I I've spoken to one or two, one or two out of a population of hundreds of millions. And one yeah. of those is still living in Moscow. I mean, he's taking an extraordinary uh, risk by posting in English extremely unambiguous statements about genocide, about the kidnap of children, about the need to return Crimea, about lawlessness. I mean, completely morally unambiguous. He's, he's quite an extraordinary individual. But that's the point. It's an individual. And that's the only account I found that is so absolutely stark and um, yeah. call it Nemtsovian, perhaps, you know, um, and he's in permanent fear of, you know, every time a, a, a van or something parks outside his street, he thinks he's going to be taken away. What Russia needs is hundreds of thousands of people like that. But, yeah. you know, they don't have them. Exactly. I think like my my sort of disappointment with so-called liberal intellectual um highly educated russians came from the fact that i actually was i went to uh, a international university i went to nyu but uh, the campus in abu dhabi um which had a quite fair amount of russians i've always been kind of like wary of them and didn't get close to many i have been speaking to a few I think I was surprising with them with a uh, very firm decision to not use Russian language was when we communicate, I spoke English to them. Um, and I think that was also making them a little bit wary of me. But um, I kind of always felt if that if something like this, like something like a full scale invasion would happen, they would really fail to meet my expectations of what I would want to see from that, from them. And and that was true, in fact, because a lot of them actually stayed to either uh, live or work abroad. A lot of them have really good jobs, a very good financial situation. They could, I think, like even take care of their families if they would want to take them out outside of Russia. I think obviously it would be um, a hassle, but it wouldn't be anything like obviously taking your family outside from the city that is being shelled constantly from bombs when you don't have a choice. Like it's it's very different. You shouldn't compare Ukrainians and Russians in that sense. But they've shown nothing. They 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 say sometimes that oh like but I like si si silently donate or give money to Ukraine, but you don't actually see that. There's no you know you can't get a proof of that. But also their statements, even they like say that they're against war, but they only post like, you know, the emoji of the brain hands or they would post like a picture with a black background and the inscription and it's that says like Bucha, never forget. Mm. But they don't ever even like say who who's done it, mm. why it happened in the first place. Or even the, the statement, Nietovani, no war. It's like at this point. It's nothing. <laughs> That's an appeasement statement. That yes. at that point, uh, it is actually a supporter of the aggressor. If you were to hold up and have a statement, Ukrainian victory, right? That's that's appreciate. Yeah. Reparations, yeah, reparations for Ukraine. You know, for every yes. life killed, for every city destroyed, wiped to the ground. Okay, but no war. Mm. Like I'm, I'm sorry, it's yeah, it doesn't give ambiguous. Anything. 
yeah. it's very ambiguous and it's very comfortable and it's very comfortable for Russians abroad to use to be seen as like oh but we're like against the war so we're good right we're like we're we're okay but they don't take anything any action so I think um that is very disappointing and I've, I've been cutting ties with the Russians I've known uh from university and colleges because I've been very disappointed and I think like the last instance of that was when I was scrolling my feed on Instagram, seeing all these horrific images from Dnipro, from people being taken out of the rubble, from, you know, people trying to find their their relatives, friends, because they don't know if they are under the rubble or they're like killed or dead. And it was just horrifying, just horrific. And I scroll and see how Ukrainians post about that, how they try to inform the world, how they uh, share ways to help they share the accounts of this family so like also foreigners can donate and help and then I just see my Russian classmate former classmate in London just posting a picture on an ice skating rink you know being happy and I'm just like I mean you know what's happening because you follow me as well like I've shared it you, like it's not like you don't you could at least maybe not you know share happy pictures of yourself like look at me not like obviously you can live your life I can't dictate but you don't even see how you seem to like people that know you and like know that you are Russian you are not only not like taking any stance or saying anything you're not even trying to like you know commemorate the lives of these people who died or like share any piece of information of how to help nothing and when I I told this to that person she was like I use ways that are better to help like for example donating but you don't even like try to say anything publicly because and I know why because probably she will get attacked I mean first of all I don't think she actually supports Ukraine but like even if she tries to like say even something like Niet Vainye, which is very ambiguous I think she would get attacked by people from Russia who follow her and she's afraid of that and and you know and that's more important for her than hundreds of people dying every day in Ukraine. And that's very telling, isn't it? Because, you know, if it was Putin's war, if, broadly speaking, Russians were against it and against the imperial aggression that underpins it, then people could post things and not expect that flurry of hate um, that exists. But, but actually, they're fully aware that they're likely in the minority uh, or even those who, it's very difficult, isn't it? Because there's also a vocal, I mean, there's a the big chunk of people who are indifferent. And, and, and to my mind, to be indifferent um, or it's to be complicit. silent is to be complicit. Yeah. But there's also a very vocal minority who don't think the war is being prosecuted effectively enough, who think that Putin should be more aggressive. And actually, you know, there's not enough coverage, I think, of the extreme nationalist wing because when you look at ukrainian activism and you try to identify where in the russian population you have similar centers of organization strong voices almost like a a cultural unity around certain topics it's not in the liberal sphere it's in the extreme nationalist sphere that you get the genuine activism now some of it of course is hybrid some of it is supported by the state it's difficult to tell which is you know genuinely organic and which isn't but it is frightening to see that uh you know the 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 hint of U ukrainian energy and spirit is actually in the in the complete reverse image um is in the sort of extreme toxic nationalist element yeah completely in the wrong place in russia exactly and i think i think it's also really um sad that media and like obviously western media tries to constantly find different angles and stories and i i get why they're doing it i get like i myself i am tired of seeing this horrific news i can't i can't 24 7 read the news about bakhmut uh or news like nipro or other things that are happening and people getting killed like you can't you you just dissociate yourself it's and it's completely normal i think it's our human psyche that protects us from just going nuts because otherwise i would have gone insane in living in ukraine 
and although I try to take care of myself uh, in terms of like my mental health, but I don't have a choice. I can't turn away and just like forget about it. I I like I can cannot genuinely do that. Um, but it seems like Western media sometimes tries to find angles, and instead of maybe highlighting how horrific actually things in Russia are in that sense, how Russia is legitimately fascist, how many people support something that is probably the most similar thing to the previous century fascism in Europe is right now in Russia and how many people actually rejoice in seeing the death of the Ukrainian. The Western media doesn't want to cover that as much because I think it's like, it's really, I don't know, it's either really dark and hopeless because they want to seem like, oh, the world's going to end soon. Because I think like once you start covering that, you might understand that they will be trying to come back and take more Ukraine and kill more Ukrainians again and again and again. And even some of those people that are considered anti-corruption that have been praised by the West and the Western media throughout the years, like even Navalny, whose entire policy is anti-corruption, which, which is not a really a policy, it's just like the bare minimum that you can do in the state. Um, they're actually pro uh, wiping out Ukraine sometimes or wiping out certain territories and populating them with Russian and wiping out Ukrainian culture. And, and that I think is a really still a hard pill to swallow for Westerners. I've even been talking to someone, I remember how um, I've been I've been talking to somebody from the media and saying how I try to find different angles to speak to the media so uh, they keep covering Ukraine and especially keep calling covering uh, what's happening also in the country apart from the war how Ukrainians are regaining their control on, on their own history and culture and how Ukrainian culture just like flourishing in the cities of Ukraine right now and it's beautiful um, they recommended me to find an interesting angle to covering the stories about war and their example of an interesting angle was something that I honestly like left me speechless I was really struggling to to even find a response to that because they said like oh you know it would be very interesting to find if there is like a Russian soldier who's living like who's like living in Ukrainian village that is occupied but he's actually helping Ukrainians there he's like bringing food to them or how you know like how he falls in love with somebody. I mean, there was like this movie that Italian director shot about like two gay soldiers, one of them Ukrainian, one of them Russian, like completely fiction and they fall in love. And you're like, you just are stand there like baffled because you're like, why are you trying to make us like almost like fall in love or feel empathy with like our murder, like a, like a person, like we're the victims and you're trying to like show like it's almost like being this like insane you know uh like a stockholm syndrome movie but you're actually not realizing that it's a Stock stockholm syndrome you think that it's a love story you know it's and, bizarre it's like you it's know, would just, they would they put forward uh well some of them might actually but would, would they put forward a you know a, a script <clears throat> you know um here's a Gestapo guard and, and and here's a Jewess, you know, let's have a story about how they fall in love. I mean, it would be perverse or, you know, uh, a, a rapist and victim, you know, it, yeah. it's no different than that. I mean, what's, I, I, this is all news to me. I haven't heard of these and the yeah, level of and perversity it, is, is, is shocking. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can send you obviously the, the reference to this movie because it's been talked about, in Ukrainian Twitter a lot and we were just I mean I just didn't even have the power of like engaging with that because it's it's, it's for me that is like the next level of how the Westerners specifically want to just easily you know resolve this and see this very simple like, like no we're all humans and you know love and unity and blah 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 can still solve this and like no we need to fight russia and russia needs to decolonize itself and fall apart in different republics and ukraine needs to win and the only way to win is in a military way mm -hmm. otherwise as much as you guys advocate for peace in whatever terms like you know peace is like a settlement and as a frozen conflict you will not care in 10 years but when ukraine gets attacked again in 10 years or less if we froze this now we're going to be the ones and our children are going to be the ones who are going to be killed again. So we cannot allow that to happen. You can say whatever you want from your 
safety of like a home in North America or somewhere else or like in France sitting, you know, because you will not have any threat of something like that happening to you. Uh, but Ukraine, Ukrainians will. So I think, yeah, that's why like also pacifism as such and in that form of like calls of like, oh, stop sending arms to Ukraine. Ukraine needs to negotiate. It's just completely ridiculous to us Ukrainians because we understand that like literally our lives and lives of our children depend on what's happening today and whether we win this war now. And it's not fanciful because this is exactly what happened in Chechnya. You know, Russia um, was able to exaggerate the threat there, the terroristic threat. Uh, they had one unsuccessful invasion, sued for peace. And then a few years later, when they built up their forces, figured out where they'd made their mistakes, came back at it with even greater ruthlessness. It's and now, sports. you know, they destroyed it to the ground, as we now see, you know, Mariupol and Grozny have a, a lot in common. And then installed a psychopathic uh, dictator who would yeah. uh, torture and uh, murder um, the population. Very similar, of course, in, in Belarus, uh, although it wasn't invaded, they were able to take Belarus uh, without a fight. Um, and I think that's what those who <clears throat> those who continue to claim that Maidan somehow, you know, everything's equal and it's all the same and blah, 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 and CIA plot. <laughs> I think they fail to understand what uh, what's going on here. And this is a slide towards autocracy. It is a covert takeover by uh, the Russian state, the GRU. And um, they think in, in very long term, you know, if they don't win this time, they'll have another go later and they'll try and fix the mistakes. Um, yeah. Well, let's let's sort of let's not end talking about Russia because it's an extremely depressing topic. Um, <laughs> let's talk a bit more about Ukraine and some of the amazing things that the publication does. Um so two things I wanted to sort of cover off there. One is you do a lot of sort of carnivals, festivals, local traditions. Um, and what I find fascinating about that is, you know, in your publication, uh, it, it, it certainly portrays a lot of these traditions, not as kind of sort of static state sponsored sort of pantomimes of culture, uh, you know, resurrected zombie culture. And anyone who's who's seen some Russian folk culture will know what I mean by that um but far more sort of organic living tradition so i'd love to talk about that and then the last question after that is going to be you do a lot of series of photographs and um uh you know the finally i'd like to know what some of the most powerful images have been over the last 12 months that have featured in the ukraine publication yeah i think there, there's a lot and it's really hard to pinpoint specific ones but going Going back to your first uh, observation about Ukraine, or yes, I think I think you're referring to a recent uh, series of um, videos and articles about the celebration of Christmas and Malanka in Ukraine, which are the winter holidays. And uh, Ukraine are actually uh, traveled around uh, the country covering how these traditions are preserved or um, sort of evolved in different villages, um, towns, parts part of Ukraine throughout the years, um, and to see how like they are now. And they're interviewing people to see um, how they remember these traditions from their childhood and how they're sort of uh, doing them now. And it's really fascinating to see because it's, it really preserves the the culture, it's something that we even don't know about because these traditions are very different from different regions. And me living next to Kyiv, I might be completely unaware of very peculiar things that other regions and people in the villages of other parts of Ukraine do. So it's fascinating, even for Ukrainians, to watch that and understand how diverse and beautiful and very unique uh, the country is. Um, so it's really amazing that they do that and they, they cover, uh, these specific things. And I know that they have like lots of plans in the future to do this all around, uh, Ukraine and cover more of these specific traditions and things. And I hope that they will be able to do that. And I hope that specifically they will be able to, um, go back to liberated regions and to also, you know, uh, show how it's done there. They actually also... Um, they fundraised for sending like a Christmas caroling, uh, we call it Vertep, which is sort of like an, a small uh, group 
uh, of people who go around the city or the town to sing Christmas carols and uh, to bring actually this Christmas mood to people. Uh, they fundraised to raise money for one of those groups or few of those groups to travel to recently liberated cities where sort of obviously people still live in a lot of devastation around them. Uh, Ukraine is working hard to bring back like the petroleum system, the gas, electricity, everything that is needed for those people to actually have the basic needs covered. And when, you know, that is the main concern, obviously people don't really think about culture. And I'm really proud that Ukraine actually thinks about bringing the culture back to those ter territories as well and to showing uh, to show these people that actually we care about them and we want them to have this piece of like Christmas and see the beauty of Ukrainian Christmas carols and etc. So um, it's incredible and I think uh, they're working right now on translating the book uh, about uh, Malanka and Christmas uh, to English so hopefully that's going to be published soon and people around the world can learn more about that. Um, and they have a few other books translated to English. So if you're looking to buy, um, you can find that. I think one of them actually came out recently in UK. It's already like being pre-ordered on Amazon. It's called Ukraine, uh, uh, Ukraine or Ukrainian Insider, and it's uh, it's been it's being published. I think uh, in UK for the first time because before they were publishing them in Ukraine. Um, and it's the, there's like a fascinating story how the book actually got to a publisher. Uh, I think one of the Ukrainian refugees brought a book of Ukrainer with her and uh, her host or a person she met, he was actually a book publisher and he became fascinated with that. Um, so all of these wor works of Ukraine are incredibly important and crucial, especially now. Uh, to talk about the role of photograph, I think... Um, a role of photography, I think we all can agree that it's it's something absolutely crucial, like people who work tirelessly to cover um, the war, to show the effects and aftermath of the Russian missile strike attacks, occupation is, is super valuable because without them, the world would not have seen even like a half of what happened. Uh, even if you think about those pictures of Mariupol hospitals being bombed or people trying to get out through the destroyed bridge in Irpin uh, in the early days of the full-scale full invasion. Or if you think about soldiers who survived but they don't have limbs anymore and how they're trying to recover and continue life despite everything. I think there's so many powerful images. Obviously, it's really difficult to name one um yeah for me i will remember a lot of events specifically in those photographs and shots that i just like named just a few examples um obviously civilians play a huge role as well in documenting the war because it's the i think like it's the first time for russia especially when they invade a country where like obviously technology is everywhere and every civilian has a phone with a pretty good camera that can capture a lot. So even like some of the civilian photographs are incredibly important, but I've, um, yeah, I, I I struggle to name one photograph, but I think you Ukrainer has like this really great photo digest that you can just sort of scroll through and see what have, what have been the most kind of like striking and telling pictures for almost every week of the full scale invasion so far. Um, so it's sort of an archive of events ca captured by the photograph. And that's, uh, I mean, that's an interesting point. I think um, that that could be the subject for a future video, which uh, going through the the images. And um, I mean, there are a couple that really stick in my mind. One is the image of the of the man kneeling for a couple of hours next to the body of his son who was killed. I mean, that that is 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 a devastating image. And then, as you say, uh, recently with the Dnipro attack, that image of the terrified girl uh, who survived in the apartment, you know, about eight floors up, um, obviously woken up in the night. Everything is destroyed around her. And by a miracle, she has survived. And you can see the terror on her face. I mean, some of those images are, are so heartbreaking. And yet there are other ones which are uplifting, you know, the memes, the humor. Uh, the extraordinary sort of resilience, the images or videos of 
of um of uh, sort of soldiers dancing um in horrific right. circumstances they're they're poignant and, and uplifting at the same time incredibly important it's something actually the also seen javelin specifically focuses on it's also using the humor and specifically translating a lot of ukrainian humor and sort of exporting it from ukraine to the uh, international community and showing how genius Ukrainians are in uplifting themselves in the most dark times they've ever been through. And the role of humor cannot be underestimated, obviously, uh, in this war and in, in our resistance against Russia. And um, I'm also really grateful that projects like St. Javelin exist and that they show uh, the world uh, the uplifting side and continue showing the world why Ukraine will win always and one of these reasons is that we can hold ourselves together and use humor in these dark times to make sure that we we have a long way to go obviously to defeat Russia and to um, fight against a lot of Russian narratives and a lot of Russian things that will come after the full scale invasion invasion but we we have everything in us that needs for it and we're using humor we're uplifting each other and we're being very refining happiness even in the darkest moments and it's absolutely beautiful and uh, i think that's what makes us different from our counterparts on the other side and of course what we'll do is we will put links to all of these sites uh in the description so i really advise the audience to check it out now i've figured out how to put images into the videos as well my editing skills have improved i will put some of the images into this video when it's published up but i really do advise people to check out the links subscribe to the news check out those um image reels because you know it's an incredibly powerful resource um and yeah, I wanted to say thank you so much for speaking to me for so long on a on a Sunday morning. Um, and I'm very grateful the electricity has held out as well. Um, but yeah, extremely grateful, Julia, for you to uh, to really share your knowledge and experience with us. Thank you so much. I feel like it's been very like <laughs> all all over the place conversation, maybe because I wanted to talk about so many things. But I hope that people find it interesting and useful. And I'm really grateful that there are people like you who are um, from the international community who keep keep uplifting Ukrainian voices and giving them platform and focusing on uh, our perspective and that on everything that that is happening. And yeah, I think that's that your show, your channel is incredibly, incredibly important in also our fight for uh, information reaching around the world and showing what's happening on the ground. I think so. I think it's incredibly important um, for people to hear voices and perspectives that they don't necessarily hear on the mainstream news, uh, on mainstream media, and to battle, of course, war fatigue which is a, a real problem as well. Yeah. Um, but Julia, I want to say thank you so much and Slava Ukraine. Hello, Slava. Thank you.